will be talking to Alex and Tati about the recent changes and what you can do to overcome these challenges, what are the real changes that you will see and how to improve your upcoming uh, digital marketing campaigns. So without further ado, it's already noon. Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here and thank you all for being here. Remember that you can use the chat to connect with us, introduce yourself, share your company, um, your contact information, your LinkedIn. We always love to connect with you and with the Besa community and abroad. Uh, so welcome, and I hope you enjoy this big training. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Let me share my screen here, and then you tell me if you are seeing the slides, because I'm not seeing the slides right now. We're seeing the slides, but not in the presentation. Oh, uh, not in presentation mode. Okay, okay. Uh, let's see. There we go, because I couldn't find that window. So you see presentation mode, right? Yes. All right, great. Thank you so much for the introduction, Lilia, and welcome, everybody. So, you know, this um, workshop today is being presented by BizHack and the South Florida IMA, two organizations that I've been affiliated with for many, many years. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to talk about Apple's iOS changes and what that means for your Facebook advertising, but also in the broader context of advertising and all digital platforms. My name is Alex Oliveira, and I'm the founder and CEO of Predict. We are a lead generation agency. We've been doing that for about 10 years. Here's my family. So today we're going to talk about challenges, and I couldn't help but uh, to tell you a story about a recent vacation I took up to New York and Washington, D.C. with the family, and we took the RV up there, and it was the first time that we went more than a few thousand miles in this RV. Well, guess what? We had three tire blowouts on the road, on the side of I-95. One of the times we had to leave the RV and go stay in a hotel. The reason I'm telling you that story is because it, 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 I use it as a sort of a, an analogy for what's happening to the digital advertising world, right? It's just bumps after bumps after bumps on the road. But the, the reality is you have to overcome those challenges, figure ways around it and keep going. And, and, and that's going to happen across the board. Same thing with my kids, you know, with this upsurge of COVID. Again, we, are, we had plans that we're not going to be able to pursue. Well, like I say to my kids, you know, we have to find an alternative. So for you guys in business, you marketing leaders, business leaders, it's finding ways to get around there. And so for, for my own company, I've done in the last 10 years, we've generated over 23 million leads for marketplaces that we built and big brands, as well as over 3,000 small businesses around the globe. And it, one thing has always been constant, and that is the changes, right? Whether it's an algorithm change or an update. And certainly the one we're talking about today, guys, is a big one, right? But what you have to do is really bake in other variables that you may not be considering, so if we're talking about the iOS update and how that impacts the way you uh, uh, obtain data and target advertisers, right? T target consumers, you also have to bake in there the, the big uh, pink elephant in the room, which is COVID. So this is a, a survey uh, that PwC did and just looking at what consumers are doing. Consumer behavior is changing. I don't have to tell you that. I know everyone knows that. We ourselves are all consumers, and so we know that we have changed our behaviors, whether it's on mobile, desktop, or going to the store. And you can see here, right, almost half of Americans are avoiding going, leaving their house. And, and then the list goes on. But if I were doing a Facebook campaign independent of the issues with iOS, I'm going to consider this. What are consumers buying? They're buying essentials. What that means for you is... You and your team and your executive team, you have to consider what people are buying, right? Because if they're not buying the product category or the industry vertical that you're in, then, well, your ads are just, you're going to reach a lot of people, but maybe people aren't going to buy your products. So, so I, like I said, understand that the changes will continue. But secondly, make sure that when you're doing your planning, for your Facebook ads or any other ads, keep in mind that we're still in COVID and there's a lot of unknowns. So it's important that you be patient and spend more time creating those campaigns. All right. So the hope, 
hopefully that gives you some context to what we're going to talk about today. Now, let's talk about IDFA, which is basically the identification that Apple created in 2012 uh, to give to uh, applications like Facebook, right? And that is basically every user using an iPhone would get a specific ID and then Apple would give that data, that information, everything that you were doing, the location, the behaviors, the interest, all that stuff. They would hand it over to Facebook. And then Facebook in turn for the last nine years has been able to hyper-target, hyper-target uh, consumers, on any of their platforms, which has been phenomenal for any of us in marketing and advertising and even businesses. Some businesses have purely grown, right? And built a business model uh, on the backs of selling their product or service on Facebook. So that's fantastic. But now we have crossed into a new era. No longer is that going to be the case because after what what is it nine years seven seven no eight years after eight years of apple giving that data over apple has decided that they want to get out of congress's way right the the ftc the fcc all these government organizations in congress they're going after big tech uh, they're going after the amazons the googles the facebooks and Apple just wants to say, hey, we want to get out of the way because what we do is hardware. We have software, the operating system. And if we can protect users and lessen the data that we collect and use to give to these companies, then we're going to do that. And so that's what the iOS update is all about. But to give it some more context, guys, we have to go back to Cambridge Analytica. If you look at Facebook at that time when everything sort of came out into the public in 2018, Facebook's market cap, their value went down by billions of dollars. And they've recovered since, absolutely. But the scandal, the misinformation, and all the stuff that Facebook has promised that they would clean up, they haven't, right? And so me as a, as a marketer, yes, I want more data. But as a consumer, Facebook has absolutely abused that power. And they've made it a little bit better. But not all the way better, which is why Apple is saying, hey, we're going to do it better. And then this way we can get out of Congress's way. But if you look at the, you know, the app developers, they are the ones that are at the top of that list as, as to who is suffering the most. Because now with the update, it's asking you, the user, the iPhone user, hey, do you want to be tracked? And Every study has shown that upwards of 90% of iPhone users, when they're asked and prompted with that question, do you want to be tracked? They say no. They don't want to be tracked across the web. Uh, so we look here at the, the, this DuckDuckGo post on uh, LinkedIn. Google and Facebook collectively own 66% of the top 15 mobile apps. That's incredible. You know, we all, everything that we do on our either iPhones or Android devices, it's Facebook and Google. They dominate the space, okay? But, um, you know, look at it here on the post on the right, how it started, how it's going. It's that the conception that privacy is really security. So, they, they're really good, Facebook and Google. They're really good at keeping the hackers away from your data. But on the same token, on the other side of the coin, they're saying, but we're going to take all that data and monetize it and give it to advertisers and to publishers. And so for that reason, I think that the changes for the consumer, the consumer is the biggest winner. The biggest loser is the app developer. And then followed by the app developer is us small businesses who, who really depended on some of those clicks and traffic. So why is Facebook worried? Well, they're worried because they have more than 19,000 app developers using their SDK, uh, their software development kit, and their publishers around the globe. So they, they have a lot of app developers who depend on that revenue. And as you can see here, reported by Facebook, they saw a more than 50% drop in app publisher revenue across the ad network, the audience network. So you know, the magic happens when you connect the IDFA to the Facebook uh, ID. When you connect those two pieces of data, Facebook can really hyper-target you. And then they, in real time, give that information to the advertiser, the advertiser being you, the company. Another reason Facebook should be worried. In the last two months, 
what we have seen, and these are projections here from eMarketer, but we did look up at, at current data. And here in the footer, you see Amazon now has 10.7% of US digital ad market compared to Google and Facebook, which make up about 60%. But Amazon is growing. Actually, their ad revenue grew at more than 60% in the past few months. Why is that? Because those of you who have products, tangible product, an e-commerce uh, website, you are able to sell those products on uh, Amazon. So you're shifting the ad budgets. And that's what we have seen. We've talked to many, many uh, advertisers of all sizes before doing this presentation. And almost across the board, I have heard the same thing. Look, we're not quitting Facebook, but we have shifted budgets, right? And you, you also have to consider one more, one more point here, guys. And, I, and this is sort of not an attack on Facebook at all. It's, it's almost giving them a, an out, which is there are over 10 million advertisers that advertise on Facebook, 10 million. So their automated AI system is always trying to catch up and they don't, their staff is not big enough to handle these, these issues that are coming up for the average small business that might be spending five or $600 per month in advertising. So you have really enormous demand still from the advertisers. And then now you have less data and less people going on Facebook on a regular basis. So you you know, you have to keep testing and if it's working for you great, but I think that the thing that most organizations and Tati will probably attest to this is the attribution which we're going to talk about here too. The attribution and not being able to really pinpoint where am I making the money? Where are the conversions taking place? That's really hard to do. <clears throat> so the five changes from the update it's changes in app advertising. So if you don't do advertising in apps, don't really worry about it, especially if you're, the, if you're not a developer. Changes in mobile web advertising, that's important. Absolutely, if you're a small business. Optimization and targeting, that really sucks. Not having that level of targeting, you're sort of back to pre-2012 where you're, you, you just have a huge funnel of customers. You know their basic demographic, you know, age, location, but beyond that, you might not know exactly if they, their affinity groups or interests are, right? Measurement, that's the big one, because if you're going to create campaigns, spend your hard-earned dollars on advertising and you can't measure it properly, it, it makes it really difficult to make it uh, a, a compelling case for your team. But the point needs to be made that, that this is not just for Facebook, it's for LinkedIn, it's for all the other apps that are out there. If, they're you, if they are um, using the app store, they, they're also being asked, the consumers being asked, do you want to be tracked? And the consumers are saying no. So this is not a Facebook only challenge, it's that that Facebook is the, the biggest one. So that's why we keep hearing about them and also because of all the issues that they've gone through. Um, and then the business manager tool setup. I mean, you know, they, they try to simplify it and the changes that they, they make are no different than what they've done in previous years. There's updates and you just have to get used to it. And then the other point that I was talking to Dan, uh, the, the founder here of BizHack, we were talking about is the fact that just 25% of total global mobile market is dominated by Apple. So look, if you have a product that is global, or a service, then you still have a lot of room for growth there, right? That are not iPhone users. We know traditionally all the data points to the fact that iPhone users are, are, have higher incomes and they will spend more money, right? Which is why Mark Zuckerberg, when they began this spat, said, hey, iPhones are for rich people. You know, he was trying to make a point uh, that um, Apple is at, partly at fault. Now, at this point, I really want you to understand because we've heard from a lot of uh, uh, companies that they've experienced an increase in ad cost. That has also been another uh, issue that, that you have seen after the iOS update. So 
This is how Facebook actually makes their money, right? With the advertising audience network assesses how likely it is that someone will click on an impression available on a Facebook publisher. Publisher can be the app developer or an actual publisher themselves. And if a click is likely, Facebook buys the impression in the, on a cost per thousand on the CPM model. And what they do in real time is then sell it to you, the advertiser. So if you're the advertiser, uh, uh, promoting your products on Facebook, Facebook's system is making that decision in real time as to what the cost is. Well, now you're not get Facebook is taking up to three days to capture that data between the consumer and the apps and whatnot. And plus, they they have a lot less people who are being tracked. So the the decisions that Facebook has to make in real time about ad costs is really they're, they're testing right now. People are scratching their heads at Facebook and trying to figure out how do we continue to make money? Well, it's clear that they're going to have to just go as, as, as high as they can on the ads and, and hope for the best until they can analyze that data. Okay, so let's go here to the next one. So actions that you guys can take, probably some of these you have heard of, some of these you have not. Most of them are very, very simple. Uh, verifying your domain, really important. So here's my, I have a, a podcast called the Dadpreneur Podcast. So dadpreneur.co, all I simply did was put a pixel <clears throat> to, to verify my domain on Facebook. So I added that little code, the script right on the header. And then I came back here and clicked verify. So what you're going to do in your Facebook business settings is you're going to go to domains and in under domains, it's going to open up and then you'll add, you'll click add, put in the URL or URLs if you have multiple URLs. And then you just go through the process of adding the verification. And the verification is definitely important because Facebook's trying to make sure that you own the website that you are uh, trying to collect data on. Okay. So about pixels, this is an important one as well, because Another change that took place is the number of events for conversion that you can track. And right now, your pixel can only optimize for a maximum of eight conversion events. I haven't heard of anyone who has been able to optimize for more. I have heard some workarounds creating multiple Facebook pages and then uh, using it on different URLs, subdomains, but that gets a little complicated. And I think it could uh, eventually blow up in your face if you try to manipulate and go around Facebook. But currently for one URL, one campaign, one Facebook page, you can only optimize for a maximum of eight conversion events. And then as I was talking about the real-time reporting, it will be delayed for up to three days. So if you're spending millions of dollars, that makes a big difference. But if you're a small business owner spending, you know, five hundred dollars or a couple thousand dollars a month, this is not going to impact impact you as much. Chances are you're not even checking that 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 um, reporting on a daily basis, right? That's my experience with a lot of small businesses, right? You kind of set it, you forget it, you optimize. If it's working, then you come back. But really important to go to your Facebook business settings and make sure that you have the pixels set up and make sure that uh, you have the uh, uh, URL verified, your domain verified. And the pixel does multiple things too, right? The pixel is also going to allow you to do retargeting, which we're going to talk about next here. Okay. So retargeting, everybody is uh, familiar with retargeting on Google, on Bing, and it's connecting with consumers who previously visited your website. So what you want to do is create lists of customers who have visited your website. And then once they're on Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger, then you can hit them up with that uh, ad, right? So really important. I would say, in my opinion, and I, I would love to hear from Tati when we get into discussion here with her, and certainly from you guys as well. But in my opinion, the, the biggest opportunity or work around this whole situation is your customer list, the subscriber list. So that's your email list. If you've done newsletters or you have a customer list that is big enough, is uploading those customers to here the source of data because you have the data from your website so you can do retargeting, but then you have customer lists. And if you don't have customer lists, well, this would be a good time to start to compile that list, whether it's using a CRM 
or using uh, email software like uh, MailChimp or Constant Contact. Super, super important. And then another tool that is, I think, going to be crucial for every business who has a website, e-commerce, service, product, brick and mortar, any type of website, is to take your analytics to the next level. Because one of the areas that we talked about a few minutes ago that is being impacted is measurement. It's measuring and the attribution so that you know that you get a return on ad spend, right? Well, again, it's a little foggy right now because we don't capture as much data, right? And going forward, it's going to get worse. That's what Apple has uh, signaled, that they're going to get give the consumer even more privacy. So for you, this would be the time to really connect other data sources. So whether you're using Google Tag Manager, Google Analytics, Google Search Console, Kiss Metrics, I mean, the list goes on and on. There's no shortage of free and paid tools for you to capture the, the, the consumer's behavior, the user's behavior on your website. Super important that you do that. Uh, bare minimum, Google Analytics, and then take that, the analyzing piece of it, not just capturing the data, but the analyzing, you have to take that to the next level. Because as I was just also talking with Dan about earlier, it, it, it can't be any longer that we rely on the conversion uh, triggers to give us that information. So now if you have a sales team, it's really important for your sales team to ask new customers and current customers how they're interacting with your company, with your brand. So doing customer surveys, it's going to be very important to talk to your customers and say, hey, Bob, hey, Jim, uh, Joanne, whoever your customer is, and say, what, how do you interact with our brand? Is it on our website? Is it on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram? And have these conversations with as many as you can, because there is no replacement for that for, for that type of a conversation. Um, and then when you pair that within analytics, web analytics, and what you're seeing on Facebook, Instagram, that's definitely going to give you a better view of the whole uh, picture. So iOS 15 preview. Obviously, we're here talking about iOS 14 today, not 15, but already Apple is talking about iOS pre uh, 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 update for the fall of this year, right? So this year still, they're going to implement and launch, deploy this, this update that has more privacy. One of the things that they're, they're planning on doing is giving users the option to allow the email sender to collect basic information as simple as open. That was your email open. So that's very tough because for most of us, if you can't, if you can't figure out who's opening your emails, it, it becomes really hard to understand if it's working. So you, I, I'm pointing this out for iOS 15 because it goes beyond Facebook. And I know everybody's interested in Facebook. It's important. But the changes that are happening right now are beyond Facebook. And it's going to impact all your digital marketing channels. And then, yes, it is all initiated by Apple. And it's in the interest of the consumer, but definitely at the expense of small businesses. So let's move on to the good news. The good news is how big social media is. You know, if you look here, four and a half billion people around the world are on social media. This is from July of 2021 from Hootsuite. So there's plenty of people still using social media on a daily basis uh, for different reasons. It's going to be a little bit harder to target them, but this is where testing comes to play, right? It's going to come and play. I have to create multiple campaigns. The offer has to be really, really strong. And BizHack does a really good job with their Digital Marketers Edge um, uh, program, the course, talking about that offer. So you're going to have to beef up your offer and, and, and then also your landing pages on your website to complement that. Now, going beyond Facebook, you can see here, TikTok was the most downloaded non-gaming app worldwide for July 2021 with 63 million downloads. You can see here, both in the App Store, Google, and Google, TikTok is number one. And on the App Store, Facebook has slid to number five on the app store to number five. That's, you know, and of course, the WhatsApp and Instagram is still there. Um, but again, everything is changing so rapidly. So it's really important that you understand where your customers are. And then beyond that, 
take a look at these social media channels and, and ask yourself that question. Are my buyers, are my consumer, the consumers who buy my product, are they on any of these other platforms? And have I ran any ads for a period of three to six months? Have I tested? And if not, this would be the opportunity to do that, right? And I am hearing from many uh, small businesses who have e-commerce that who are actually testing on uh, TikTok, selling products, and they're having good um, performance. So I can't I can't validate that because I didn't do it, but um, I do have clients who are doing that. But we did run lead gen campaigns, just like you would run a lead ad campaign on Facebook. We did run lead ad campaigns on TikTok for clients in industries and on uh, to audiences that you wouldn't think would work, but it did work. Not not as well as Facebook and not as um, uh, low cost per acquisition as Facebook, but it did work. Okay. So now that we've talked shop, now I want to bring on Tatiana McDaniel. She's the CEO of Happy V, a, a women's wellness company. It's such a great website and check her out on Instagram. But also she is the, one of the BizHack marketing coaches. Welcome, Tatiana. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you, perfect. Coming through. Awesome. Awesome. Great. Well, I'm glad to be here. Oh my gosh. You've said a lot. I said a lot. Yeah. Reflecting. I'm reflecting on so many ways in which this is all impacting our business. Well, our, my business in particular, but that of so many other people. So yeah, really appreciate the presentation, Alex. Thank you. Oh yeah. You're welcome. Definitely. So let's talk shop and you know what? We'll take questions from the audience as well. You, you guys sure. are here to ask questions. So if you have questions, ask, but my first one for you, Tati, as you can see here on the screen, I pulled up two ads from happy V and you guys are yep. running a ton of ads and you have like the perfect oh, yeah. product to talk about, right? It's for women <laughs> yeah. who are who, who's that audience that's online. Tell me how yep. you, like what changes have you experienced since the update? Sure. So um, in our particular case, we had, we had two major changes. One was the obvious impact of iOS 14. The other was our marketing strategy. Our team changed from running ads internally to running ads with an agency. And so it was an interesting shift in that um, a lot of the iOS 14 um, hurdles we were able to experience in-house before then experiencing it with an agency, which I think is something just to state for a lot of people who are looking to work with other vendors who cannot manage the capacity of marketing on Facebook in-house to be flexible with your agencies and to understand that these things are impacting everybody across the board because um, we've certainly experienced that with our agency, granted since we've done marketing on the inside, um, in-house I mean, we understand and we're aware of what those changes are. And so for us, um, we're a women's wellness business and we sell dietary supplements for women in different stages of their life. life. So we have prenatal products, we have menopause products. Um, our issue with Facebook is a little, is a little, it goes beyond iOS 14 because since we're in the dietary supplement industry, we're a little restricted in the type of advertising that we can send out and in the type of retargeting that we can do as well. Um, so for instance, I'll give you a really easy example, dynamic ads. Um, that's the classic, like you looked at a red shoe, you were pixeled, you were cookied, and then somehow on another page, on another website, you're seeing that red shoe again. That's your classic retargeting. Um, there's a way in which you can do that dynamically with specific products in a catalog. And so, and I'm getting a little bit into a lot of detail. So Alex, if, if I'm, if I'm ahead of myself, stop me in my tracks. No, um, you're good. I think the catalog is an, an important point to make, I yeah. think for, for those uh, product based or e-commerce businesses who aren't taking advantage of that. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So so there are ways in which you can implement using a Facebook or Instagram catalog to now put your products front and center of the people that have been seeing them. If, of course, you're able to pixel them because they say, yes, follow me and track me. Um, where we have a little bit of like where we scratch our head is 
my understanding, and Alex, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is even if you're opting out, you're still going to be receiving ads. The ads are just not going to be based on your traffic and your web search history. Is that correct? That is correct. That's my understanding as well. Right. So, I mean, even myself, I've opted in. So I said, yes, Facebook, <laughs> go ahead and follow me. Go ahead and track me. Because I'd rather be serve ads that are relevant to me and my lifestyle and my na and my web navigation than an ad about something that's completely irrelevant to me. Um, also, because I'm in the industry, and so of course it makes sense that I be tracked. But um, what we're finding is that yes, a lot of the things that Alex already mentioned, con conversion numbers are going down, attributions for sales are becoming a little bit murky. Um, we've got, we've got a team that manages our Google ads. We have a team that manages our Facebook, and then we do some dynamic, um, some programmatic ad buying as well. And when we're receiving the sales, we do see the numbers go up on our e-commerce pages, but the attribution as to what drove that traffic and what drove that conversion is becoming a little bit less clear as this iOS 14 starts to roll out even more and more. And iOS 15 is going to be even even more complicated. Uh, yeah, massive. And so talk to me, you know, if we take a few steps back, when I think one complaint that I've had from a lot of <clears throat> companies doing ads on Facebook is at the targeting level, when they're trying to build that audience. So not if they're building a customer list or retargeting, they're just, you know, trying to target a specific audience that that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the update, it's like, they're like, where are my tools? Where's all the, mo you know, the, the, this and that. And I'm going, well, you know, that's, we expected that it was going to be bad as far as like sure. the, the level, but um, how are you getting around that in any way? Because I think for companies that really know their customer, really know their, the persona, right? Understand. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing, hey, yes, it's tough, but I know who my customer is. So I know sort of how to position the offer and all of that. Sure. But if you really don't know your customers as well as you should, then that tool, not having the Facebook audience tool, you know, the insights makes the it even insights. harder. Yeah, absolutely. And while I will say this, um, obviously, Cambridge Analytica was probably the pivotal moment in which we all understood from a, from a digital marketer's perspective, we need to start protecting people's data. And so there has been an evolution from the D to C side, the direct to consumer side that we've noticed um, in protecting people's data. So for instance, uh, our products, I know that Alex, you mentioned Amazon. Amazon is a huge marketplace. It is growing. We as an advertising um, unit of our company have shifted a lot of dollars towards advertising on Amazon, but Amazon has pulled back a lot of the information that they're giving us as well about the consumers. Why? Because they want to own the data. They say it's because they want to protect the customer's data, but they want to own their data. So the number one thing to understand here is there's like a shift, a pull and push between protecting people's data and owning the data. And so what I find here with Facebook's removal of the audience insights is that they're saying that they're protecting the data of, of the people that are navigating through Facebook. So creating core audiences in which you're testing to understand who would even be a potential consumer of my product or who would even be interested in scheduling a 30 minute webinar for my service. Sometimes when you're advertising, you don't have, you don't walk in with, you know, 10,000 email lists of existing customers. So you've got to go after that. So I would say that, you know, work with tools and teams that can guide you. Um, the BizHack has a wonderful program and we help build out core audiences, but there are, there are other ways in which you can sort of, you know, create your customer email list. Maybe you build out campaigns where you're just trying to do lead acquisition. So you're just trying to get emails rather than trying to get a sale, right? It's a lot easier to get somebody's number than to take them to bed with you. That's sort of the marketing analogy. So start there, start with baby steps. And then 
through email campaigns, you can start learning a little bit more about your consumers, what their interests are. You can offer them quizzes and surveys and then use that data, that information to then build out person- personas on Facebook. Awesome. That's great insight, Tatiana. And, you know, I think another thing is I notice here both of these ads are videos and I went through some of your ads and most of them were videos. So talk to me about the I- importance now that you are, it's, it, it's harder to target the exact customer. So your offer becomes even more important on Facebook, right? The offer meaning the ad copy and the visual. So a static totally. a carousel versus a video. Talk to me about that. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that um, we do a lot with Happy V is we run video ads because we can retarget those video viewers. And so the theory is if you're running a 10 to 15 second video um, and it could be at any level of the ad funnel, but you have somebody who watches, let's say 90, 95% of the video, chances are that somebody who at least you've piqued their interest, right? Maybe they didn't click through the video. Maybe they didn't watch the full 100% of the video, but at least they've watched a little bit. So now they're, they're what's called a qualified lead, right? A qualified viewer. And so as you've gathered enough people that have seen and viewed your videos, then you can retarget those people. And that's a feature and that's something that Facebook allows you to do. So we leverage that as a retargeting method. Sorry, I'm on a street and there's cars driving by. I apologize for the background noise. No, it's good. Um, but that's what we do in order to retarget at least someone who's interested. And then we bring them through the funnel. So we may start with a video that's very generic about the business, a very high level awareness ad. And then as they start to view our videos and as we start to retarget them, we then hit them with supporting data points, maybe a customer review of why we're even saying that we are this and this, followed by at the very end, potentially an offer or some sort of a compelling message that's going to drive them to convert on our website. Perfect. No, that's, that's awesome. So yeah, you you guys have heard it, you know, the videos are super important and Facebook and the algorithm and the way the ads work, you heard me mention 10 million plus advertisers, it's impossible for them to manage everyone. But one thing we know for sure is that those video ads can, can mean a lot to, to the conversion and to the nurturing and just to building a better brand to be able to stand out between you and your competitors who may not be using uh, video ads. So um, another thing I wanted to chat about is um, here, let me go to the next slide. So as far as today's takeaways, I want to go through each one real quickly and kind of get your take on it. So you guys mentioned you shifted some of your budget to new channels. So testing new channels, are there any other channels for you guys that you're testing right now? Oh my gosh, yes. So we are heavily, <clears throat> heavily exploring TikTok. Um, TikTok has its own challenges, but, um, but we're finding it to be a good way for organic reach. And um, the way the algorithm, at least within the last few months, has been working, it really helps to promote certain videos on your page. So you might have a video that gets, I don't know, a few thousand views, and then you'll have a video that'll go viral of like close to a million views. So that's one way. Um, Pinterest, for our specific category, we're in the women's wellness category, but we're also in the education category. So we do a lot of teaching um, because we want to inform women to let them know and be familiar with what's happening in their bodies. What are the ingredients that they're taking? Um, Dietary supplements is an unregulated space with the FDA, but there's a lot of good knowledge that if you read and and if you're informed, then you can make some great educated decisions about, you know, the best nutrients for your body. And so Pinterest is one of those where we do a lot of infographics. We do a lot of, um, a lot of advertising on Pinterest. And then I would say if you're a B2B or if your business even has a B2B layer, Definitely don't discount LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a great place to also cast wide nets for for different types of leads. Um, so those are three of the channels that I would say are alternates to Facebook, your typical Facebook, Instagram, Google Ads, etc. 
Perfect. How about conducting customer surveys? This is one that I think is, is you know, been around since the beginning of time, uh, talking to your customers, getting to understand what, like how they're interacting with your company or brand or products, competitors. But I think it, people get lazy and um, they say, oh, well, let's just do a survey monkey or something like that. You know, hands off where really you need oh. to be talking to people. So are, are you doing any of that? We are, we are. So we have a few different surveys that we put out. Um, One is a simple post-purchase survey. So after somebody has already completed the conversion, we'll ask them how they heard about us, how they found the navigation on the website to be, a few other open-ended questions just to get some extra data about their experience. Mm -hmm. Those are usually simple and you leave them to less than five questions because you don't want to give them like fatigue, right? Um, But then we ask a lot of surveys, for instance, um, we have a subscription model. And so when the user decides to unsubscribe, we want to understand what happened, what was, you know, what could have been better in your experience or what drove you to unsubscribe to make that decision. So we'll hit them with the survey there. You're not always going to get answers, but at least you can start over time aggregating all of that information. And that gives you valuable data that you can draw insights from. And that can help also orient what your marketing strategy is going to be. And are you guys doing on Facebook or Instagram any sort of uh, surveys or polls or quizzes? We are not running polls or quizzes on Facebook. We do all of those through apps on our website and then through our email campaigns. Yeah. Okay, great. And so, you know, number three here, step up your customer journey analysis. We kind of talked about that, really understanding your customer being, it's really important, connecting data sources collecting more information on sources of sales qualified leads, right? So marketing qualified leads, sales qualified leads, the two are very different. And I would say, Tati, and I don't know if you agree with me on this, but I'm I'm a big fan of the sales teams always because I've always been doing leads, you know, for over 10 years. And Mm -hmm. so I feel those salespeople's pain and I understand there's always a disconnect there between them and marketing. But I would just say that that... We've been obsessed because of all this data that Facebook, the Apple was handing over to Facebook. We've been obsessed with conversion attribution. So yeah. oh, it's got to be very clear that it converted, but that didn't exist before. So how did we online for at least a decade um, attribute conversion without all of this information? Well, we did. It's just that some of it was done manually talking sales teams, talking to marketing teams, to web analytics teams, Right. Exactly. So you're almost taking a step back to like back to traditional advertising. So yes. for, for uh, marketers, I mean, especially digital, mar- digital marketers, I think in the mm-hmm. last decade have just completely geeked out at the idea of being able to track every single thing. And like, look, we can prove to you that this is the attribution. And, um, you know, it, it, in an advertising agency, um, if all of the teams are kept within house, so you have your SEO team, you have your Facebook team, you have your Google Ads team, et cetera. Um, It was always a fight for who got the credit, who got the attribution (laughs) for all of the sales. When in reality, um, the average consumer usually looks at at least eight different types of advertisements of the particular brand before completing their purchase. And so um, what used to be the trend, the last click attribution, no longer really that no longer applies. Um, so, so it is a little bit tricky, but I think having been in the space for so long and having understood and seen how important a collective of different forms of advertisement makes for a sale, um, mm-hmm. even though we don't physically see the data in front of us, we know that it's important. We know that it's necessary. And so we're going to continue to run our ads because um, so long as the numbers on our own e-commerce site are showing growth and improvement, then, you know, we know that it's working. Perfect. No, thank you. And what about using the subscriber and customer list? One question that I often get is both in the email marketing side, but also just lists to upload to Facebook is, should I buy lists? Just 
list blindly just because it, you know, someone may reach out to you. And like, we all get these spam emails of databases being sold and yeah. you say, Hey, uh, we have the, all the attendees who went to this company or to this conference or whatever the list is. Have you tried, do you recommend using lists that aren't yours that you didn't build personally? I don't. Yeah, um, <laughs> and, and, it, and it sounds like a real PG answer, but I'm going to actually tell you why. So we, um, we have collected a list of a bunch of customers from Amazon before Amazon stopped passing back email information. And so we had quite a few like collected lists from Amazon users. Then we had our own website users that would purchase on our website, like honest collected emails and now with ios 14 let's say of the i'm going to just pull a random number 10,000 emails that we have maybe more than half of them have opted out um so those lists are no longer showing as much strength as they did a few months ago or, or last year even um so that's i think the issue with buying a list is like you don't know when those emails were collected you don't know if since then they have dropped, they have opted out of being tracked. And so it makes it a little more complicated. I would say stick to collecting your own emails. You're just going to have more qualified data that way. I agree 100%. What about number seven here to help you through this iOS update and Facebook, increase social media nurturing efforts. And what I mean by that, Tati, is, you know, uh, often companies who are running ads, they sort of run the ad and forget about it. And they don't actually have someone on their team who is there to nurture those, those leads, the users, right? Who are then going to engage with your company. And it might not be off of Facebook. They may not click through to your website. They may go from the ad to your Facebook page. So what, what if any, um, strategies are you guys using to nurture? that engagement, because it's really hard to do on Facebook. You know, even as a, a consumer, it, it, there's not a lot of um, reason for me to go to a company page, right? It's, it's just not, unless there's a great offer or a video or something that I'm so interested in. <clears throat> Is there anything that you guys are doing to nurture those users there? Um. Well, in the case of our business in particular, we, um, we don't do as lengthy of a nurture uh, process because we're selling $30 products, right? We're not selling like a $1,000 course or even a hundred plus dollar product. Um, so what we do do is we make sure that we have a really buttoned up customer service team in place so that they can answer any questions when it comes to DMs or comments or any type of engagement in our advertising. Now, that aside, I have worked with different students and different clients that are in that business that are trying to generate leads for high ticket items. Those, I will say, not following up and not nurturing those potential leads is like literally getting to the finish line and then making a U-turn. Like you're almost there. You've done so much work. You've done the prep work. You've done the training. You've made it to the finish line. And then you're going to turn around or you're going to sit down. So I would say a hundred percent, Alex, you have to continue to nurture. And then you have to also be organized in categorizing and bucketing. What's a cold lead, what's a medium lead and what's a really hot lead. And then have either one person who is qualified to go after all of those or, um, a dedicated team member that can manage and understand how to get across to the cold lead versus how to get across to the hot lead who's almost at the cross of the finish line. I like your analogy of the finish line and then you turn because it's so true. You work so hard right? to get them through this funnel, yeah. which is a different customer journey for everyone now. And then you get them there and then you ghost them, right? And I, and I agree with you. I have clients who are like, well, I can't I can't have someone looking at all the DMs on all the platforms. And I, and I say, well, why, if you have a page set up there, then why wouldn't you have someone looking at the communication? To me, I look at, at all the different social platforms like phone lines. Like if we go back 50 years, you know, 20 years even, um, you had different phone numbers for different locations of your business if you were a brick and mortar. And that phone number is that connection, right? between you and that customer. 
And I may call this line and you may call that line, but it's communication either way. And I think that that's what we're talking about. If it's on Messenger or on, on LinkedIn or whatnot, it, there's never a good enough excuse to say, well, I just, I just don't check it, but once a month. Because I do hear that from small business owners. I don't have time. And I say oh, there's yeah. applications that funnel everything into one place, right? Yep. Yep, exactly. I mean, you can implement chat bots. Um, I know no one wants to talk to a robot or a computer, but at least that helps categorize. Um, if you don't have somebody that can be responding in real time, they're at least sifting through the data. And then when you get to you know take a look at it, your chatbot has categorized people into different Excel spreadsheets or, and so you can just sit down and, and get back to all of them in a quick and easy manner. That's one really easy, simple option. Right. I mean, I recently had an experience with a, a client account where they had a GoDaddy account and um, the, uh, the password that they had for us, you know, they just couldn't get us there. So I said, you know what, let's just yeah. go, to, go to Twitter Went to the Twitter GoDaddy account. I understand I'm talking about a huge company like GoDaddy, but it's the same for any other company. We engaged the GoDaddy bot, which we really thought it was a person because the bot was so flawless. And I'm not a fan of bots, but this bot asked, I don't know, a series of eight, nine very intelligent questions that were relevant to our statements. And we were going back and forth. And I would say half the problem got solved just working with a Twitter bot. Right now, I, of course, it's it's GoDaddy, so it's going to be sophisticated um, more than the average small business. But there's definitely solutions out there, and if you don't want to do a chatbot, then then just do human to human, right? But it's important that you communicate. I think, like even your website, um, Tati, I noticed that in the footer, you guys have the the icon or link to Facebook and Instagram, and uh, while you're on all these other social platforms, you chose to just you know add those two. Is there a reason why? Um, not necessarily. I mean, we, the thing is, so as a, as a business, I think as a small business, I should say, you should focus your strengths on a hand, a couple of platforms, right? Like if you can manage a handful of platforms and do them well, that's better than being everywhere across the board, mediocre. And so that's probably why we decided, although our strategy has since changed quite a bit from when that was built, um, but I still hold that true. Um, if you're going to be, let's say, on LinkedIn and Facebook, be on LinkedIn and Facebook 100% do that right, um, rather than LinkedIn, Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, all of the different platforms, but then you're hardly engaging and you're hardly showing activity. And that's exactly why I asked you. I was hoping that that was going yep. to be your answer yep. because yeah, okay, good. when I have clients who say, well, I want to add all the icons. I'm like, but you're not everywhere. So where are you? And they'll say, oh, it's this one or that one. Great. Just You could still have pages there, but don't ask people to go to a place that you're going to post once a year and then go, wow, I sent my customer down a path that really made my brand look, you know, uh, absent, which is worse than, you know, trying to, to be there at all. So, and then the last one is data challenges across all social platforms, guys. When you're thinking about a key takeaway here, that's probably one of the biggest ones. Dan and I talked about it, which is, this is not just a Facebook issue. It's an every app issue and it's a digital advertising issue. I know Tati, uh, touched on iOS 15. I did as well. This is only going to increase. So I think the takeaways for today is that you guys really need to adapt. And even if you just take one little nugget from here today, whether it's testing a new channel, connect more data sources, verify your domain, right? Upload customer lists, do one of them and do it well, but take your time. Because what I've noticed, Tati, for, for our team and our clients is that we're spending more time trying to do the attribution. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. And, and, it, and it sucks. That's, that's all I could say. But on the same token, because I started in this industry way before any of this existed, I, I, it just feels very familiar anyway. So sure. it's kind of like, okay, we're back to what it used to be, which may not be a terrible thing for most consumers, right? Sure. Sure. I mean, but educating the educating clients, and I always say this, I've worked um, and I, I should have mentioned this in the beginning. 
Um, but my background is on the agency side. So I've worked at various different advertising agencies before then going client side and sort of starting my own business with my friends um, or with my business partners. And I will say that there is no better client, meaning industry side, there's no better client than a client who is informed. And so it's great, all of you that are business owners, small, medium, large business owners on this webinar, it's wonderful that you're participating in these type of discussions because these are the these are the things that then you can go back to your agency or to your vendor or to the one person who manages your marketing and have educated conversations around um, and understanding the capabilities, but also now in this case, the restrictions of each of the platforms is it's crucial. Perfect. Well, Tati, it's been an awesome hour. We appreciate you taking the time from over, overseas, right? I'd say I guess the, <laughs> the advantage of all this virtual stuff and you know the connectivity that exists today, it makes it possible, right? Absolutely, Alex. I'm sitting in a courtyard in Seville, uh, Spain right now. Oh, so. <laughs> well, lucky you. Yeah. Well, guys, yeah. does anybody have Thank any you. questions for me or for Tati? Um, or for the team at BizHack, you know, if, if there's a question that you may, may think of later, you can always email Lilia or the team at BizHack or even Safima directly. And then here is um, on the 18th next week, Cheryl is going to be doing a, a workshop about LinkedIn, right? Uh, about spending your time on there and whatnot. And Cheryl, as most of you know, is uh, the Safima, one of the founders, founding members and um, yeah, so it was great. And I really, like I said, want to thank everybody for coming today. Hope you got a lot out of it. And um, yeah, definitely. I see a couple questions here. I will respond just in a chat. And I think Lilia, you're posting the link to the event. That's awesome. And just like I mentioned in the beginning, you know, with my trip with the kids, you know, the three tire blowouts. There's challenges. There's challenges ahead everywhere in our lives and in advertising and in business, consumer behavior. As we go through this COVID surge again, I want you guys to keep that at top of mind, probably even more top of mind than the changes that you're experiencing with advertising on Facebook. So keep that in mind and just keep grinding. There's there's le lots of opportunities out there for you guys to, to grow your business. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Alex. You're welcome. You're Thank welcome. You. Have a great day, everybody. Great job, Alex. Thanks so much. Thanks, Dan. All right, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.